just prior to the storm. Um, and appreciate Celia's and everybody's flexibility for shifting from our previous date in January. Um, the uh, library staff was taken out by COVID. Uh, we're all better now. Um, uh, reminder to turn off any um, cell phone noises and any other distracting devices. And uh, the format tonight is going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to give a very brief introduction, and then our guests will have the floor. Um, She's and, fixing uh, your phone. Thank you for reminding her. <laughs> and um, there will be time for a Q&A, uh, I, ho I hope, at the end. So tonight, we welcome Celia Riker from just up the road in Bridgewater Corners. She's been writing all of her life, and in journals, she's written poetry, short stories. She's had articles published in newsletters, local newspapers, and the um, Vermont League of Writers. But her first career was horses in Michigan, where she actually lives for part of the year. This is her Vermont launch. She gets to have a Michigan launch, too, since she divides her time. Um, and there she trained horses and riders on the Humper, Hunter Jumper Circuit. And I cannot say that in a row, ever. Very quickly. <laughs> um, Celia returned to school to study gardening and landscape design, and then she found herself drawn to hiking. Her first book, Walking Home, was published not quite two years ago, um, in the middle of the pandemic. And it's a collection of stories and remembrances linked by what she calls a difficult hike along the Vermont along Vermont's Long Trail. And her first novel, Augusta, which we have the honor of launching tonight, is based on the hard luck story of her grandmother. And I'll turn the podium over to Celia. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, this is not premature. I'm a, I'm, I'm, uh, I published my first book two years ago. Uh, to call me a late starter might be an understatement. But um, yes, this, this book has been with me for a long time. I, I found the notes for this when I began to actually write the book. They were 30 years old. How did I find them? I went in and there they were. And um, I had started thinking about this that long ago. So um, this isn't, isn't new for me. It's, it's been in the back of my mind for a long time. Um, and I do have two books. And walking home, uh, Augusta does show up in walking home because when I'm walking on the trail, I'm thinking about things that happen. When I get to the top of Mount Baker and I see snakes sunning themselves on the stone, I'm reminded that my grandmother taught me how to catch snakes, not make muffins or crochet. Um, when she found out I was afraid of snakes, she taught me how to catch them and showed me how beautiful they are. So um, she was a different sort of grandmother. Um, <clears throat> And um, this, is a, this is actually a daguerreotype that's only three by two inches that my, uh, my Aunt Yvonne gave to me. And she said, um, your grandmother was 13 when she was married off to the widowed father of one of her classmates. And this was taken on her wedding day. And she's wearing her eighth grade graduation dress. Ew. So, um, I didn't know, there's a lot I didn't know when I was growing up about what her life had been like. Um, she died when I was six, so I have some very vivid memories of her, but uh, most of them have to do with walking in the woods and going out on the lake, so, and feeding the ducks. So, um, but I, I just love that picture. I thought that was, I was hoping that would be in my cover. But the publisher said, no, no, no. That would make it look like a biography. And this is fiction. Um, because I, I thought I was going to write this from the omniscient third person so I could tell the reader what she was thinking and feeling and as well as her children and the people around her. And I ended up writing it in her perspective. And um, so they, they chose that cover which I've gone to really like. At first I thought, no, it's not about the city, it's about her. But it is uh, definitely brings your attention to her. So what I plan to do is talk a little bit about um, the book and Augusta and the writing process. 
and also um, read a few pieces. And right now I'd like to read, first of all, the introduction, or the prologue, I should say. The round toes of her sensible shoes were barely visible among the fallen leaves. The sidewalk beneath Autumn's litter was smooth and level, but her pace slowed as she neared the backyard on the corner. Her thin gray coat ruffled in a gust of wind, its mismatched buttons barely holding it in place. Will she be outside? Will I get to see her face? If she's indoors, I'll just walk on by like so many other times. Thoughts whirled through Augusta's mind as she neared her destination. She was glad the sidewalks were empty. It was no secret that she used to have four children and now had only three. But people who knew her story never spoke of it. She was ashamed of what she'd done, but as a farmer's daughter, she'd learned early about the harshness of life. It hadn't felt like she had a choice even as she made it. A waitress raising four children on her own in 1920s Detroit was but one of many sad stories. A regular customer had heard of Augusta's situation and they had become friends, or at least friendly. Over the course of many meals, they got to know one another. Though they never sat down together, they chatted as Augusta brought sandwiches and soup and Judith always left a healthy tip. Augusta told family and friends when Otis left. She thought that her husband might have gone back to Alton, Illinois. He talked about that town like it was a slice of heaven and had chosen Alton for his son's middle name. Augusta contacted people in Illinois she'd heard Otis mention, but they denied knowing where he was. She was afraid that her children would end up in an orphanage, all of them. She had to work to feed them, which left them home alone. The two older girls, Ivan and Thelma, 12 and 13 years old, looked after their little brother, Buddy, and the baby. <coughs> Sometimes exhausted at the end of a workday, Augusta watched her daughters deftly changing diapers and wished their lives were easier. She could provide care or she could provide food, but it seemed impossible to provide both. Lottie was an infant when her father walked out of their lives, young enough perhaps to be unharmed by an adoption. It wasn't clear to Augusta exactly how she let it happen. Judith and her husband had always wanted children, but after many years they'd given up trying. They promised to love and care for Charlotte. They would give her a good life and provide money for Augusta to care for her family what was left of it. Augusta strained to remember how the question had been asked. We were friends. No, we were never friends. We exchanged friendly words. I said too much and hurt more than I should, feeling sympathy for someone who had so much more than I would ever have. Sympathy sailed both ways in those conversations, and now, since the adoption, we rarely speak. She shuffled through the leaves, hoping to see her little girl in someone else's backyard. There she is. She's wearing a pinafore that I could never afford. She looks happy and healthy. But what could I do if she wasn't? I couldn't pick her up and take her home. And what if I did? What if I reached over that fence and hugged my sweet Lottie to my chest and ran away with her? But I can't do that. I can only glance over as I walk by like any stranger on any sidewalk and hope to hear her laugh. The little girl in the perfect pinafore jumped up from her toys and toddled toward the sidewalk. I know I shouldn't be here, but I can't stay away. Lottie has seen me too many times, and her voice pierces me. Hi. Augusta ignores her, ignores her daughter, her throat spasming with the effort. Tiny hands touch the woven wire fence. Hi. Augusta looks away as if the voice had come from across the street. The last time she'd seen that face was the day she'd handed over her sleeping baby. She thought she'd felt the worst pain of her life on that day. She didn't know that the ache would persist, that it would stab her in the night and torture her days. A voice called from the house. Charlotte, come inside, dear. Come along, come along. I named her Charlotte, but call her Lottie. Now she's someone else's Charlotte. Augusta's sensible shoes headed for the other side of town where the leaves fell on cracked, uneven sidewalks. I heard that story many times, that she used to walk past the home where her daughter was being raised. And when her daughter recognized her as that person who walked by all the time, she never went back. She didn't want to confuse her daughter. So this is fiction, partly because I don't know how Augusta felt. I imagined it. And 
even this story, I imagined it always happening in the fall. I imagined the sidewalks being empty. And I always imagined they lived on a corner lot because I didn't want to think of my grandmother walking through the alley. So for those reasons, uh, much of it may or may not be exactly right on the mark. Um, I, had to, I did a lot of research to find out what life would have been like on a farm in Augusta, at, in uh, Arkansas, Augusta, in Arkansas at the turn of the 20th century. And, um, and my aunt had told me about the, the photograph that she had been married off to the father of one of her classmates, so I created that classmate that I'd never heard of. And, they, and in order to tell you, the reader what their life was like, what their school was like, what their family life was like, I could tell their stories. And the stories that I heard were often vague and contradicting. I don't know what caused them to leave Arkansas and head for Detroit. Um, I know that in my research, I found out that the lumber companies did almost the same thing in the South that they did here. They went in and took all the, all the lumber. And on the farms, they would go in, and if they gave a farmer enough to buy a tractor, they'd let him take all the lumber they wanted. It didn't matter what it was worth. So they, they came out way ahead on some of these dudes. And then they provide them with um, seeds or, or um, small plants for tr seedlings for tree uh, apple trees. Um, I think apples and strawberries and cotton were the things they offered them. And since cotton was going for 12 cents a bale, everybody put it in cotton, and you know what happened to the cotton price. And so a lot of a lot of farmers then lost their farms, and that's how I had Augusta leave Arkansas for Detroit. And, um, and my mother did tell me that my grandmother mar married the same abusive drunk twice. Now, I didn't want to think about my grandmother at 13 marrying an abusive drunk, so I made him nice until he lost the farm. Then he became a drunk and became abusive. And, uh, and her second husband started out nice, as I would hope she would have been a little more careful, but it took a long time for her to remarry. And... Um, and it was his drinking that caused him to lose his job. And then he became, began to drink even more. And so she did sort of marry the same person in two different places. But, um, and I had her move into a tenement, which Detroit didn't have very many tenements. Um, the people she came up from Arkansas with, again, I made this up. It was uh, a family of four, a um, husband, wife, and two children. Um, they shared the truck, pickup truck that they brought everything up with. And uh, she ended up in a tenement, and they ended up in a shack down by the Detroit River, which evidently the shacks down by the Detroit River really were shacks. They were made out of whatever material they could find glommed together. So I learned a lot doing the research. Every time I, I kept seeing pictures of tenements because I was trying to find out how they'd live, it was two rooms, and in between the rooms was a door and a window in one wall. There's a window and a door between the two rooms. And then I found out they passed a law that said each room had to have a window, so they put the window between two rooms and took care of that. Um, that didn't work out very well. But they did pass another law that said each, each apartment had to have one outside facing window. They called them tuberculosis windows. Just trying to make it healthier in there. <clears throat> Little things that I learned. So um, one of the things, I don't always write in um, chronological order. I wrote the, the, what I just read you as a pro it became the prologue. I wrote that first because I wanted to tell that story for sure. But I thought it was going to come later in the book when that actually happened. Um, and this scene, I put off and put off and put off because I couldn't imagine how someone could marry their daughter off to somebody who's old enough to be her father. <clears throat> now, Cookie is Clara, um, her nickname Cookie, and she is Augusta's friend, and her father's name is Simon. Augusta's parents encouraged her to continue helping Cookie a few days a week 
after her mother passed away. Mama said, there's a lot to do for one young girl. Simon liked Augusta's cooking and even complimented her gravy, which was getting better with practice. Augusta came in the afternoon when her work at home was done, stayed through supper. She could see how tired Cookie was. One night when Augusta started toward home, Simon said, I'll be walking you home tonight. She was surprised by the offer and answered, that's okay, it ain't nearly dark out. He took the bag from her hand and said, I'll carry this for you. We got some talking to do. They walked in silence until they got to the creek where Simon cleared his throat and started in. Your papa and me been talking. You've been handy around the house and I'm not used to being alone so much. The back of Augusta's neck went cold. What was he talking about? You know about men and women and I'm a man. You're just barely a woman, but you're one for sure. Her neck turned hot and her stomach churned. They walked in silence until he asked, you got nothing to say? The silence followed them to her door where she hoped to escape to her room, but Simon walked into the kitchen behind her. Her parents sat at the table like they were waiting for her and they weren't surprised to see Simon. He gave her father a questioning look and her mama stood up and said, come along girl. They went out the door and walked to the bench near the vegetable garden. Mama sat and patted the seat beside her. Augusta didn't want to sit, but when Mama patted the bench again, she did. Her spine so straight it hurt. Mama began, did Simon ask you to marry him? Well, if that's what he meant, it ain't what he said. Mama took a breath. Some men have trouble saying things like this. It don't mean that he don't mean it. Did you answer? I didn't know he asked. Don't be silly, girl. Simon is a good man. He works hard, he's honest, and he wants you as his wife. But mama, don't but mama me. A man like Simon, but mama, he's old. He's older than papa. He's, mama wouldn't let her finish. He's fit and strong, and if you outlive him, you'll have children to take care of you, and in the meantime, you'll have a home and a family. Your papa and I can't be feeding you forever. But mama, he don't go to church, and he never let Cookie or her mother go neither. After another deep breath, mama said, Betty and I were longtime friends. That's the only problem she ever had with Simon. She said he was a good husband and father, and he earned the respect of churchgoers around here by being better than, than most of them. She told me that she never regretted marrying Simon. No more butts from you, girl, or you could butt yourself into dying alone. Mama, I don't love him. Mama took another long breath. Love ain't all it's cracked up to be. A home and family are more important. You think I should do this? Augusta couldn't believe what she was hearing. Look at your choices. No youngin's gonna have a house and farm to offer. They won't have a life of hard work to show you what they can do. You'll be picking a pig in a poke and lucky to find anything close to what you're being offered. Mama, I'm 13. My mama was 12 when she got married. But you said that Cookie's sister was too young to be running off to marry and she was 15. Mama straightened up for one more long breath. It was the running off that was her trouble. She knew her papa wouldn't approve of that boy. Your papa approves, I approve, and you need to think about what your choices are. A good, honest, hardworking man ain't easy to come by. They sat in silence, each waiting for the other to concede. Mama spoke into the darkness. You think about this. Really think about your life, how you think you could do any better. We'll talk again in the morning. I'll tell the men they'll have their answer tomorrow. Your papa won't be near as easy on you as I've been. She walked away, leaving Augusta alone in the dark. I didn't think I could write that, and once I started to write it, I felt like I was eavesdropping on someone else's conversation. It just flowed. I thought, there were time, it's a time when, what are her choices? There's just not a lot going on in their lives. She can't go off to some big city. And uh, so that was uh, that. I kept putting it off and putting it off. I um, I had a hard time thinking how how a parent would do that. And once when I started to write it, it just flowed. And I thought there are times when I'm writing always when I'll feel like I'll stand back, I'll sit back, and look at what I've just written and think, where did that come from? And there were times when I was writing this when I felt as if I were channeling Augusta, that I wasn't just wandering off, that I was being directed 
And I'd sit down to write one thing and something else entirely would come out. And I, Whoa, I don't even. So it was a little different than the normal. I don't even know where this came from. I felt like it came from her. And um, all, this, all these things are happening to her. And she's raising a family during the 1920s. And waitresses don't make that much. And um, in the book, I, I was looking for that section today, and I couldn't find it. I need to find it. What she made compared to what it cost to take a bus to work and buy eggs and bread. And, and she, she was struggling. Um, and raising children. And I did write some scenes about the kids, the daughters fighting over clothes. Um, and this is one scene. Um, it's later in the book. Augusta came up from the best basement. Why is there a dollhouse in the cellar? Ivan and Thelba looked up at one another but didn't say anything. Augusta folded her arms. They looked at one another again, and Thelma said, you tell her. Buddy put it down there. He took it out of the Erickson's basement. He stole it? Augusta looked around as if Buddy were hiding somewhere in the kitchen. Well, kind of. Jimmy told Buddy that he couldn't get that big dollhouse through the Erickson's basement window. And Buddy said he could. By the time he got it out the window, Jimmy had gone home, so Buddy had to hide it until he could show it to Jimmy to prove that he did it. Buddy showed, showed it to Jimmy, but when they went to put it back in the basement, the window was locked. So Buddy left it in our basement? Augusta's hands rested on her hips. He didn't know what else to do. He wanted to give it back. Yvonne defended her little brother. Buddy stood on the Erickson's porch, balancing the bulky dollhouse, waiting for someone to answer the door. Augusta stood on the sidewalk behind him, certain that he was hoping Mrs. Erickson or Shirley would answer the doorbell. But Mr. Erickson loomed over him. He looked at the dollhouse, then Buddy, then back to the dollhouse. What's this doing here? Buddy glanced over his shoulder at his mother, then back at Mr. Erickson. I'm sorry I took your dollhouse. I didn't mean to keep it. If you didn't mean to keep it, why did you take it? Buddy tapped his right foot with the toe of his left shoe, then tapped the left foot with the right toe, and the dollhouse wobbled. I just wanted to see if I could get it out the window. Mr. Erickson put his hands in his pockets. Augusta thought he was fighting back a smile. If you didn't really want the dollhouse, why didn't you put it back once you proved that you could get it out? Well, Jimmy went home, and I had to show him I did it to get the baseball card he had. So you did this on a bet? Mr. Erickson was laughing. Jimmy had a Babe Ruth, and I don't have one. Mr. Erickson looked past Buddy to Augusta. What do you think we should do with this young man? If you have some chores for him to do, I'll make sure he does a good job. He looked at Buddy. For the first chore, you can take that dollhouse back down to the basement where you found it. Shirley will show you the way. Your mother and I will come up with a proper punishment before you get back. Buddy was walking down the hallway toward the kitchen, and Mr. Erickson asked Augusta, did he get the card? Did he get the card? Yeah, the baseball card. And I did hear that story from my father. He, he, took, he swiped that dollhouse just to see if he could get it out the window. He did some other kind of strange things as a child. But um, I didn't know her life had been this difficult. The grandmother I remember, um, that's me and Grandma and Aunt Thelma. And she's given me one of those, now you listen to me, young lady, moments. And you can see she, she was very into lawn care. Uh, I saw other pictures taken where it's going all along the, the shoreline. Everybody's yards look like this. And that would be much better for water quality than what I saw when I went back to the house um, not long ago. There's no drop off to the lake. It comes straight out on a perfectly mowed lawn to a seawall. and. Um, this is actually healthier. I don't want to get started on this. I did get into gardening for a while. And I am. This is in it, envir environmentally much more um, helpful than the, the lawn that's there now. 
And my grandmother never got a decent pic. My father never got a decent picture of my grandmother. She'd say things like, oh, buddy, you don't want a picture of this old horse face. And she'd make faces. You have lots of them like this and some like that. And, um, and my mother said the only time you could get a decent picture of her is if she was holding a baby. And that's my sister, Faye. And that, when, once I got that picture, I thought, that chair was so comfy. I loved that chair. I could sleep curled up in that chair. It was, it was nice and big, and it smelled like grandma. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a great picture. And my mother said, the only time you can get a decent picture of her is when she's holding a baby. <clears throat> and this is the grandmother I remember. You need to do something, just do it. You don't need to ask for help. And um, I think that car needs a little paint, too. But um, the cottage that she lived in that I thought was so magical had a hand pump at the kitchen sink. She did have a toilet, but you had to fill, that may have been the bucket, fill a bucket and then take it and pour it into the toilet to flush it. So we did have a flushing toilet, but we didn't have a water source except at the kitchen sink where you had the jar on the windowsill to prime it. And if you did, forgot to do that, you had to go down to the lake and get the water. So... Um, so this is, the, this is the grandmother I remember. Um, and the fact that my father, as soon as I see this picture, I think how many times my father opened doors for women, and he opened a door, car door for his mother, and he closed the door, and then she'd open it and say, you know, buddy, my arm's not broken. So um, she was a little ahead of her time in that respect. But um, it, when, when we were going through slides, my sister and I said, I want to find one of Grandma's making a face, and the one with she, where she's holding you, and and the one where I'm in the, at the lake, and then I want one where she's standing on a stepladder washing her car. And my sister said, "Oh, I've only got this many slides, and he had so many. I don't know where the others are. All of them showed up in the packages of slides that we had. So those were the those were the four I really wanted." And I hope she would be proud of the story I created. I don't know how far off the truth it is, uh, because so many stories came down to me um, in pieces and vague. And for instance, my father broke his leg when he was seven. The story I heard, he's had a scar from his knee to his hip. And he said he was playing in a cardboard box in the alley, and a garbage truck ran over. Now, and he spent a year in the hospital and another year on crutches. And my brother said, no, he wasn't run over by a garbage truck. He was run over by a Wonder Bread truck. And I thought, Wonder Bread truck, that would have been better for the book. And my sister said, oh, no, he wasn't hit by a truck. He wasn't run over. He was hit by a trolley car when he was on his bike. And so three completely different stories. And... Uh, each of, those, each of them, us think, our, we heard our father tell us that. And I hope he didn't just make up stories, but maybe he did. But, um, so that made it a little easier for me to write this as fiction. I could just go where it, I felt like the story should go. And uh, like I said, I hope she would. There's a part of me that goes, oh, Grandma, I don't know where you are, but... Uh, I hope I didn't mess this up too much. So, if you have any questions or comments. What happens to her stepchildren? Did he neglect them? She had children. She married the widow of uh, the school son, right? Yes. As far as I know, I never heard of him. I never heard of them. I never heard anything about them. They were her age or older. I never, I never heard of them. I never saw a picture of either of these husbands. Um, and felt, heard very little reference to them at all. Now, um, her second husband was my grandfather, and my father did look for his father when he was a young adult, and my brothers looked for their grandfather as young adults, and they couldn't find any evidence of him. And my brother, when he couldn't find any evidence of his grandfather, said, you know, that SOB may have just ended up in the Detroit River. He wasn't a very nice guy. <laughs> So they couldn't find him. So, <clears throat> what year was this? Uh, 
she born? She was born in 18... My book opens in 1906, and she was 12. So, so she was born just about the turn of the century. Yeah. Did, um, so she really did um, give one of her children away for adoption? Yes. Did she ever... It did end well. We ended up with, I ended up with three grandmothers. My father's mother, my mother's mother, and Graham. She was much older than my grandmother's. I had to get this close to her for her to see me. Um, but, and I heard different stories about how that happened. One was that, and that's how I tell it in the book, that um, Lottie wanted to meet her biological mother, and the other was that Buddy went looking for her. But I don't know which of those is true. So they came, but up, it, from, um, they came up from Arkansas to Detroit during the Great Migration? They yeah, part, yes. There were so many people coming up because there were jobs here, and lots of them. And Detroit was growing very quickly. Now, the reason there weren't very many tenements in Detroit is that Detroit was growing very quickly as the auto industry was growing, and people could spread out more. Where in Boston or New York, the city grew before the car came onto the scene. I lived in one of those tenements that you described, 32 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're still there? They're still there, they built a long way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Historic. In the 1920s, yes. The Guardian building is the one that has the light shining up. What's it called? Guardian. Guardian. The Penobscot building next to it is the one I thought. I thought the one with the light shining out was the Penobscot. And at least I was in the right neighborhood. But I know the building still stands. Yes. So the photo of her by the uh, water. That's not in Arkansas. That's, she that's, that's when she retired. She, when I knew her, she lived in a cottage, in a tiny little cottage on the lake. That's what grandmother I remember. It was called White Lake. It was in, it's in Michigan. What town? The town was White Lake, and the lake was White Lake. <laughs> what, was the, what were the stores called? White Lake. There was the White Lake restaurant and the White Lake. Actually, it was Jackson Boulevard. I can actually remember that. I went there not long ago when my nephew was visiting. I said, I just want to see what it looks like. And we got out and walked around and then realized that there were cameras in the building looking at us. I thought, gee, I wonder what my cousins are thinking. So the publisher must have thought she had a... Did that tell me the publisher thought that Augusta had almost a, a glamorous life? I mean, that's kind of a glamorous. Well... When I questioned the cover, my, um, one of my friends who is into design work said, and I said, you know, it's not about the city. And he said, it's not, and her life was not glamorous. And he said, yeah, he said, but look at it. That is 1920s Detroit. And I said, yeah, but the first thing you see, he said, what's the first thing you see? I said, those lights shining up. And he said, and where did they take your eye? To Augusta. And because it's the same color as the, sepia tone in the image, then you go to her image. He said, the guy who did this really knew what he was doing. So. Um, she gets married, did she get married at age 13? Yeah, the first time she's married at 13. And um, <clears throat> apparently this is real? I think it was at the time. I mean, maybe not everywhere, but it was. It, it was Arkansas, but I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was a different time. There were there were there were times when it wasn't that unusual for twelve and thirteen year olds to marry. So, uh, at what age did she have her first child? I'm not certain. I had it happen at about fifteen. I assumed that that would be as long as um, I could wait. She had two children and ended up in Detroit, and I don't know. I don't know any of those figures. And, and I can't 
I'm sorry, do you know how he, was it a divorce or did he die or, you know? I never heard a word about him, never mm -hmm. saw a picture of him. Mm -hmm. I never heard anyone speak of him. Yeah. And when I asked my father what, my father and his sister, what his name was, the two of them couldn't agree. <laughs> It makes it kind of hard to follow. They're good, they're good sources for fiction. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> so. she, um, this one, would she lecture her offspring on that, about uh, not growing up fast? And, you know, do what I, did. I don't think she did, but none of them did. Um, they all married a little later in life like normal people. Um, I don't know that, I know that Ivan was angry with her for a long time about her living, uh, letting, living with Otis and letting Otis stay there for too long because the, the daughters did end up being taken out of the home. And Ivan was angry about that for a long time. Taken out by who? Uh, child services. And why one of them ended up on the farm in Arkansas and the other one ended up in an orphanage in Columbus, I do not know. But my aunt, said, my aunt Yvonne said, I got the best deal being in the orphanage. I got three square meals a day and I got to go to school. And she said Thelma worked until her hands bled and they didn't let her go to school. So. Did they reunite as a family? At the end, yes. Yes, I knew all, all of them. But it didn't look like that was going to happen anytime. When she put finger to computer keyboard, how long did it take you to write the story? This probably took a total of a year and a half, maybe. I mean, if I'd really put to it harder, but I didn't. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first book took a couple of years to write. Probably three years to write the first one, because well, part yeah. of it, I was still on the trail and trying to hiking. hike. Yeah, okay. I had a lot of hiking to do. But I did start to write it when I thought I might not finish the hike. Mm -hmm. but. The more I see that image, the more I like it. That, is, that image actually belongs to Wayne State University. And my publisher had to buy that image. And, um, How did that happen? Are you talking about the why, why Wayne State owns the image of the, oh, the skyline of Detroit. The city, oh, I thought the city the image, not the, the, no, no. Was. No, no, the city <laughs> image. Um, and as a result, this book is, is in the Wayne State University Library. I thought I should go to the library and see if it's actually there. But um, yeah, the, the skyline image belonged to Wayne State University. I'm sure one of the buildings in there is part of Wayne State's campus. After you completed the book, did you feel sorry for the story? Yes, I needed, I, 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 I've been thinking about this for so long, and uh, it felt good to have it all down and hopefully something that she might approve of, I hope. So far, yes. I, I haven't had anybody read it that, um, my sister, when she read it, because I thought she's outspoken, but not by many. And uh, I thought she'd find something in here she didn't like, and she said, I thought it was great. I said, it's not exactly on the mark the whole way through, and she said, who knows what really happened. It says novel right now. Yeah, it says novel right there. That is fiction. But you might have been more accurate than you knew. Possibly. I, I tried where, where I knew things happened. I knew how old she was when she got married. I do believe my aunt when she said that. How old was she when she was 38? She got married in the second I am not certain. I don't even know where those records are. I knew it was her daughters were like 12 and 13 when she remarried. So it was a while. I think she probably decided enough of that. 
And then she met this handsome Irish guy. Did you say he was a drinker? Yeah. Who who to thunk it? So you never tried to go to um I I don't know if it was emails or but genealogy records. I did find some things, but I couldn't find others. And I talked to other people who looked. And and one of the things, my father was standing in our kitchen. And there's a picture, there was a picture there of um, a building in Alton, Illinois. And my father told me that story about the fact that my father thought that Alton, Illinois was a slice of heaven, and that's why he gave me the middle name Alton. Now, I have since found out that Augusta had a brother whose middle name was Alton. Again, which is true. I mean, that's the story he got from his mother. And the reason that that image was there is Don was born in Alton, Illinois. And, and I had this thing that his parents had given me, and my dad saw it, cause it and he told me that story, and I thought, hmm, interesting. Because Alton isn't the most common name. She almost made it to 60. 60? Yeah, she was She was a few weeks short of her 60th birthday when she passed away. Yeah. Well, her life had not been easy. And she was, um, she was in the hospital with pneumonia. So I do remember that day. I remember staying home from school because we were going somewhere. Getting all of us getting into the car, going down the road, and somebody pulled us over. And a person that I don't know came up to my dad's window and told him that his mother had passed away. And we're all just sitting there going, And we may have been staying home to go and visit her or something, I don't know. But um, because it was unusual for all of us to stay home from school when no one was sick. So I do remember that moment, but I don't know who it was. And what year did she die? 49. 50. Yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was about six, so yeah, 54. Not to give away your age. Yeah, don't tell anybody. <laughs> cool. So, thank you.